In this video, we're going to be talking about the first part of evaporators, and we're also going to talk a little bit about superheat. Superheat is a very valuable troubleshooting tool, and you will be using it constantly when you're checking for proper refrigeration charge and other aspects of a refrigeration system. So let's start off with what evaporators are and the different types of evaporators that are around. We have two principal types of evaporators. We have natural convection. Okay, natural convection doesn't use any mechanical means to move a cold air or air through the evaporator. Forced convection uses fans or blowers. Okay, natural convection is not found that often in smaller or light commercial applications and residential applications. Okay, it's found very heavily in um, extremely heavy process cooling or frozen food warehouses and stuff like that. Um, forced convection, again, uses fans or blowers. This is the one you're going to find most frequently. Now, there's two different types of operating design. Direct expansion is where the refrigerant directly cools the air. Okay, That's where the refrigerant is on the inside of the coil, and the air moves across the coil, and the refrigerant absorbs the heat from the air. Most HVAC systems and refrigeration systems are direct expansion. Indirect expansion is also found out there. Okay, An example of this is a chilled water system. The refrigerant cools a medium. Okay, By medium, we mean water, brine, or something else, and that is circulated and cools the air. Okay, so in a chilled water system, the refrigerant is chilling water, and then the water is being pumped to other components to cool those to cool that area. Okay, used in very heavy commercial systems. We have two types of evaporators. We have a dry type and a flooded type. Okay, now the dry type evaporator has 25% less refrigerant than the flooded type which means there's more vapor in that evaporator. Okay, the advantages of the dry type, less refrigerant, less chance of flood back to the compressor, because remember, compressors can't handle liquid refrigerant. The disadvantages of a dry type evaporator, it has a slower pull down under heavy loads, and the systems run with slightly higher pressures. Flooded type evaporators is almost all liquid in the evaporator. Okay, the evaporator is full of liquid refrigerant, basically, and as it boils off is where it returns to the um, compressor. Now, as we know from prior conversations, the more liquid is that's in the evaporator, the better off our efficiencies are. So, flooded type evaporators are 50% more efficient or effective than dry expansion. Liquid refrigerant is in contact with most of the coil surfaces. It's used heavily in chillers where the water coil is submerged in refrigerant. The disadvantages of the flooded type of evaporator, we have to have more refrigerant, and there's a greater chance of liquid getting back to the compressor known as floodback. We have several evaporator types, and you've seen some of these already. We have a plate type evaporator, we have a wall shelf evaporator, we have a wall evaporator, we have a fin and tube, we have bare coils, we have gravity, and we have forced air. The plate type evaporator is found at the back of a refrigerator. Okay, In other words, it's a plate. It's a solid plate that has some tubing or some gaps inside of it. Okay, When the gas comes out of the plate, it's returned directly to the compressor. Sometimes they're used on shelves for contact freezing, and normally this type has no fans. Okay, it's used in conduction and convection to absorb heat. And sometimes it's used in domestic refrigerators and freezers. Think about the little dorm refrigerators that don't have a fan or anything, but have a plate that refrigerant runs through. Shelf type evaporator has no fans. It's used in domestic refrigerators and freezers, primarily in freezers at this point. It uses conduction and convection to absorb heat. It's built directly into the shelf of domestic refrigerators and freezers. Okay, and they're very frequently damaged by homeowners using knives and hammers to remove blocks of ice from the shelf instead of just defrosting the refrigerator. The wall type evaporator 
It's used in chest freezers and coolers like the white reach-in freezers found around stores. There's no coils visible. The coil is actually built into the wall of the freezer. Now, fin and tube type evaporator, this is the most frequent one you're going to see. It's used with forced circulation in a commercial or high-end residential type system. It requires a fan. It has more efficient operation because of the fan. I don't have to have as large surface area, and I'm moving a lot of air across that coil. We also have a bare coil type evaporator. It doesn't have the fins. So the bare coil is not as efficient, and it has less surface area. You see them in older systems, and they are used in immersed systems where liquid is in contact with the entire coil. We also have a gravity type evaporator. Okay, gravity types of evaporators are used where high relative humidity is desired. It has a lower coil temperature, the difference between the supply and return. They're used in deli cases. Okay, they don't have any fan. Cold air falls upon its own, hot air rises, so it creates its own little air pattern of the cold air falling because it's heavier, and hot air rising goes across the coil and comes back. Forced air blower type is used in frost-free domestic refrigerators, those without a defrost coil. Normal air flows through the coil, and it's also the most widely used type in commercial refrigeration. So our evaporator has a couple of purposes. First, it has to cool. It removes the sensible heat. And it also dehumidifies. It removes the latent heat and causes a change of state from vapor to water. So things that affect evaporator efficiency and capacity, surface area, temperature difference, the speed of the refrigerant moving through the evaporator, the conductibility of the metal, the metal thickness, and the air volume. A low temperature evaporator also has to be defrosted periodically to prevent ice buildup. The defrost cycle or capability is required any time the evaporator un operates under 32 degrees. Now here's the thing, not the temperature of the box, the evaporator. Okay, so if the box temperature is maintained at 36 degrees, if the evaporator is un running under 32 degrees, I still have to have defrost. Ice causes superheat problems. Ice is, a, is a, ice is a really great insulator, and it will actually prevent the heat exchange from the air blowing across the evaporator. So ice is going to cause superheat problems and a loss of efficiency and eventually compressor problems because liquid refrigerant will start going back to the compressor. So defrosting a low temperature evaporator coil can be accomplished by the use of electric heater or a hot gas bypass from the compressor to the discharge line. A dirty evaporator and subsequent low evaporator pressures will cause low head pressure. Head pressure, remember, is your high side pressure. The defrost cycle is initiated by a time clock. The defrost cycle can be terminated by time, temperature, or pressure. With a direct expansion of evaporator coil, the refrigerant must boil away as close to the end of the coil as possible in order to ensure that frost does not accumulate and the evaporator continues to operate at a high efficiency. Now, superheat goes along with the evaporator, which is why we're talking about it in this lesson. Superheat is a sensible heat that's added to the vapor refrigerant after a change of state has taken place. Okay, superheat is the difference between the boiling refrigerant and the suction line temperature. Superheat is used to check and see if the evaporator is a proper level of refrigerant. Superheat is gained in the evaporator. Refrigerant picks up additional sensible heat after the change in state from the liquid to the vapor takes place. Normal superheat for a TXV system is between 8 and 12 degrees. Depending on the application, this could be changed to be much lower or higher, but the good rule of thumb is 8 to 12 degrees. If superheat is high, the causes can be starved coil, which is a low refrigerant level in the coil. Again, we're talking about what's going on in the evaporator coil. If the superheat is low, causes can be flooded coil or too much refrigerant. Now, do not adjust refrigerant with superheat alone unless you're sure you know that the system should work. Okay, in other words, don't don't be Joe technician out there and just start changing superheat 
and refrigerant in charge unless you're absolutely sure everything else is correct. Complete vaporization of refrigerant should occur around the last bend of the evaporator. Superheat is additional heat, okay, that happens after that change of state finishes, okay, that is superheat. The TXV as a metering device is designed to maintain proper superheat. That's what the bulb is doing on the TXV. It's actually sensing superheat, sensing temperature versus pressure. With a fixed orifice or cap tube, adding charge lowers superheat. Removing charge raises superheat. So to measure superheat, take the temperature of the suction line with a clamp-on or taped-on thermometer. Try to do it within six inches of the evaporator. However, you can do it elsewhere, but we have to adjust pressures with that. Okay, take the suction pressure and convert to the temperature of saturation. In other words, look at your low side gauge and convert that to temperature. Subtract that temperature from the suction line temperature. Okay, so basically you have a suction line temperature you've taken, you have a temperature of saturation, which is your low side converted to temperature. Take the difference of those two, that is your superheat. So we have an R22 system. The suction pressure is at 68.5, which is 40 degrees. Suction line temperature is 50 degrees. 50 minus 40 is a superheat of 10. Okay, now, if your condenser is in a remote location and the suction line is over 8 feet, okay, and if you take your superheat, your temperatures out at the outside unit, add 2 psi to your suction pressures, okay, just because of pressure drop. Now, 2 psi, the reality is, in most systems, it's not going to do anything. But just add 2 psi before you do your temperature pressure change. So, when you troubleshoot with superheat, first of all, try to troubleshoot with superheat if you're not using a TXV system, okay? TXV systems actually change superheat based on the sensing bulb temperature, so there's a little bit more to that with a TXV. However, if you're on a cap tube system or a fixed orifice, okay, you can troubleshoot with superheat. For most domestic and commercial units, Superheat is 8 to 12 degrees. Now, whatever is done to superheat is the opposite of what must be done to refrigerant. And let me explain that. If you have a superheat of 20 degrees, the superheat has to be lowered. So you have to increase the refrigerant charge or flow. If you have a superheat of 2 degrees, the superheat must be raised. So you have to decrease the refrigerant charge or flow. So again, the Whatever you need to do to superheat, you have to do the opposite to the refrigerant charger flow. Anytime you make a superheat adjustment, you have to wait 10 to 15 minutes prior to making the next adjustment. This wait time allows the refrigerant to stabilize. That's why I always say refrigeration is a hurry up and wait. The difference between the temperature of refrigerant boiling in the evaporator and the temperature at the evaporator outlet is known as evaporator superheat. When measuring evaporator superheat on a commercial system with a long suction line, the pressure readings should be taken at the evaporator outlet, not the compressor inlet. Now the reality is you're not going to be able to do that most often. That's why that 2 psi that I talked about a little bit ago makes is what you do. You would just add 2 psi. Superheat measurements are best taken with the system operating at design conditions. In other words, the box cold, the evaporator cold, out of defrost, stable. Evaporators can be multi-pass. That means the coil has been folded over on itself or is actually two or three coils clamped together and fed by a distributor. When an evaporator coil is multi-pass and has a superheat that is higher than others, this can be caused by uneven air distribution, a block distributor, or even a dirty coil section. One of the best things you need to do if you're working in a restaurant reach-in or walk-in, take a flashlight and shine it up into the coil. Okay, take the cover off the coil, take a flashlight, shine it up into the coil, and look for saran wrap or plastic wrap. Stuff like that gets sucked into those coils very frequently. 
Evaporators that are used to chill liquids, like the found, ones found in slushy machines and soda dispensers, can easily have a normal superheat, but not be cooling properly. This is caused by deposits built up on the liquid side of the evaporator or poor circulation of liquid. So you can actually have good superheat, but something's not cooling properly. Okay, and it's caused by deposits built up on the liquid side. So it would be like on the slurpy side. So superheat is an important troubleshooting tool. Think about the different evaporator types, and when you're first looking at a piece of equipment, know what that evaporator is supposed to be doing. Okay, before you do anything else, look at the evaporator type, figure out what it's supposed to be doing, look for blockages, look for anything that's messing up airflow to the evaporator.